All right. Why don't we get started uh, while we wait for people to come in? Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, really excited to present this third P2P fireside uh, chat with uh, Pramat Sena. Uh, just a quick background on Pramat. Uh, just chronologically speaking, he's a graduate of IIT Kanpur. He studied me metallurgical engineering. Uh, after which he went to University of Pennsylvania and has a PhD in mechanical engineering and applied mechanics. And then subsequently he joined McKinsey uh, where he worked from 93 to 2006. And he was actually one of the key members who set up the Indian office of McKinsey uh, over the years. And then post McKinsey, he's, uh, he's had a, a, a really flourishing career as a man who's built many institutions he was a founding dean of ISB. He's one of the founders at Ashoka. He's the founder of the Vedika Scholars Program. He's the founder and chairman of Harappa Education, uh, a sort of a digital tech uh, kind of a, a, play, a, a, a place where you can build skills which are not taught in the classroom, sort of the modern, modern day skills. So I'm sure uh, many more such institutes that... Uh, I'm not pro probably mentioning, but a man who's who's really behind uh, several world-class institutes out of India. So a real honor to present uh, this chat with Pramat Sena in the context of how we should think about our journeys in the complex uh, world of work. Let me just bring Pramat into the room. Just give me one second. I'm here, Deepak. Thank you. Hey, Pramod, good evening. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. How are you? Doing very well. And it's wonderful to have you back as part of the webinar. Uh, we we spoke many moons back in the context of the podcast, but it's lovely to have you in a face-to-face -face chat in a, in a webinar format. Yes. Thank you for doing this. In fact, that chat uh, we had last time, I think, was in multiple locations. <laughs> we couldn't quite finish it in one go. Correct. It was as short as a series. You're right. You're right. Um, and subsequently, I've had the privilege of speaking to your uh, accomplished sister as well, Manjari Jaruhar. I forgot to mention who's for the for the purpose of the listeners, who's the first woman IPS officer from Bihar and one of the first few uh, women IPS officers coming out of the country. So, real privilege to have spoken to Pramath and some of his family members over the over the last few years. I think we've become a part of your journey. <laughs> Correct. Pramath, actually, uh, I'd love to spend the bulk of time today talking about your recently published book. Um, but before that, uh, I'd love to talk about your journey. Actually, in the book, you talk about, you use this term uh, squiggly careers to describe how nonlinear journeys uh, can be. And uh, your journey is as nonlinear as it gets. So I'd love to know a little bit about your journey from uh, studying metallurgical engineering to what you do today, but maybe shining the light on some of the key transitions uh, you've made along the way. Sure. Uh, the term squiggly careers is uh, one that is the title of a book. Uh, also, on maybe potential uh, uh, interviewees for you. Uh -huh. one. Uh, uh -huh. The two women who's Helen... Tupper and Sarah Ellis, if I'm not mistaken, but you can Google it. Okay. okay. Uh, but yes, it it does feel squiggly. Some of my friends call me random. <laughs> but uh, I think the key transitions were the transition from the shift from IIT to University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. It seems like a normal transition, but it wasn't because I switched disciplines uh, from my undergraduate discipline to my postgraduate discipline. And the discipline name doesn't capture what I actually did, because what I did was uh, a PhD in robotics with, with, with an advisor who was in computer science and a, another thesis collaborator who was a psychologist. Interesting. And so on. So that transition was a material transition that has actually affected a lot of my thinking and also my thinking on education. And that happened because I was 
quite uh, quite uh, uninterested in in the subject that I was studying for my undergrad, and the switch allowed me to uh, get reengaged with being a techie and an engineer. Uh, but again, there was another disillusionment that happened, which was with being an academic, which happened after my PhD. I actually worked as an academic for two years and found that uh, it was extremely, uh, it was not for me. And that was a big shock because you've invested so much in studying and preparing to be in a particular career. And then you realize, oh my God, I made a mistake. Or it seems like I can't, I can't do this. So for a second time again, I, I was pivoting or uh, going off in a squiggle because I didn't like something or felt I could not make things work in a particular area. But then that left to McKinsey, and I was just fortunate that McKinsey too was looking for people like me who did not have MBAs. You can talk more about that, but I was called a non-MBA uh, and, and a diversified hire at that time. I think that were the two big switches early in the career. The transition to entrepreneurship on one hand, which was my business career, and the foray into higher education as a administrator or creator builder was kind of gradual. It mm -hmm. wasn't such a big shift, but I think as I started to don multiple hats as a business entrepreneur and as a nonprofit education institution creator, I started to find that I really enjoyed the education hat much more than the, the, the business hat. And this whole point about purpose and meaning and passion, which mm. is also part of the book, uh, had also started to mean something more as you grew older, that that, that that's where you did your best work if your passion coincided with what you were doing. So this shift to only focusing on higher education was a more gradual realization, but, and it took time, mm -hmm. which also, because it took time to realize, it took time to, to, to transition. It wasn't a sudden transition or a sudden pivot, but, Today, where I am is very different from where I was 10, 15 years ago. So that was the other big transition that happened is moving away from the world of business to the world of education, where I'm still doing a business, but hmm. I don't feel like a business as much as it feels about learning and education. Got it. And in, indeed, writing a book about learning and education, which I would have never thought I had much to say or, or, or write about. So yes, this has been the 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 other big transition in life. Got it. And let's talk about the book, uh, Pramat. You've titled it uh, "Learn, Don't Study." Um, talk to us a little bit about the sort of the the thinking behind the title, but more importantly, why this book and why now? Give us a sense of how this came about. Sure. Somehow people see me because of my background or because of what I've done with the institutions I've built as a bit of an academic counselor or a career counselor. I don't do it formally, but informally, people are asking me questions about their children's education or their own careers or in the case of a number of our students from my different associations, when they are making decisions about what to do next in terms of postgraduate education or doing an MBA versus working India versus abroad. And I find that constantly people are obsessing about 
finding a, an answer that gets rid of uncertainty and therefore anxiety and fear of the unknown. So mm -hmm. people are trying to get to a solution early enough so that you don't have to worry about the future. And if anything, the pressure to succeed seems to be going up even more than perhaps it was in the days that you and I were students or early in our careers, even as actually for more educated and privileged people, the number of options have expanded tremendously. So mm -hmm. it almost seems contradictory that on one hand, you have so many more opportunities, yet people are feeling even more anxious about their future and where they will end up and about, oh my God, what do I need to do today so that I can secure my future? So that's one phenomenon. But what really triggered the writing of the book was that the way people are thinking about decisions, even with this pressure, the way they're thinking is still very traditional. It's the same question that people were asking me 20, 25 years ago when I think they first started these conversations with me. And what is amazing is that though I don't believe those questions are relevant anymore or they have to be, people have to think about these decisions very differently today, but they're thinking about it in the traditional way when the world has changed completely. It's like 180 degrees, I feel. So can we speak about that, Pramant? Uh, in what ways has the paradigm shifted? Yes, the first thing, uh, and some of this may sound cliched, but I'll just quickly capture this because a lot of people talk about this. Uh, there are many more options, firstly, and I've already mentioned that. Deepak, I mean, did you ever imagine that you were going to be a leadership coach and doing a very popular global podcast and now a live show and so on? For if the number of options available to and I, I don't mean to sound elitist. I, I do assume that this is available to people who are slightly more educated and privileged. We are talking about such people here for a minute. But the number of options have just exploded, I would say, relative to what it was for me and for you. Many yes. years. The second is that you don't know what those options could be. Hmm. So... You know that there are many options, but you don't know what those options are, which is a very challenging yet exciting situation. That actually adds to the uncertainty and the pressure I was talking about before. And then the, 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 the last part is that the... The progress that is taking place in just human society and economy and, and the world in general, and the pace of progress is actually requiring you to live longer and do many more turns at what you do in that period. So it's not just, it's not only about uh, the pressure it's also and the uncertainty but also the additional uncertainty of the number of turns you will have to do <laughs> over a longer period of time i think these are profound shifts these are not small shifts these are very profound shifts yet when i go to a and I, and, I, and I crystallize why again in a minute, because yet when I go to a Ashoka University event two days ago where a hundred parents and children who have already taken admission have come, all the questions relate to, oh, 
what will they study? Will they study enough computer science? Will they study enough economics? And will they get this kind of job after this? It's very linear thinking that comes from the way we thought. And, and I don't blame parents. I think they, they only know that that path. So this other world that I just described is, is inconceivable in some ways, right? You, you can't hold it in your brain. How do you plan for that world? Because for us, it was very simple. If you are good in science, study engineering or medicine. And by my time, medicine had also lost its sheen. So it was only engineering. And it seemed like the only degree for people who wanted to you know, go and try and be successful. So anyway, those are the ways in which the world has changed. And because I felt that people were not recognizing that change or not knowing how to think about it, I didn't want to write about the change so much because other people have written about it, right? Industry 4.0, workplace of the future, yeah. and so on. And now chat GPT. So everybody knows things are changing. But then how do you think about your education and your career? in a world like that is what I thought would be helpful to pen down. It's also not easy to articulate this, I would find increasingly, right? Because these are slightly, uh, what, what was natural to me, I found was not natural to others. So even when I sometimes try to explain, people's eyes would glaze over and it would feel like I was being very philosophical. And, and almost spiritual in, in describing how you should think. But I, wanted, I want to tell people that, no, this is very practical. This is how life is. And it might find it difficult to put it in words, but here's nine case studies for you. And look, look at the range of these cases. These are not just people who studied in the most elite institutions and these are not the super academic achievers. These are people from very different starting points, yet they had these careers. And it's going to be the norm and it's real. And if you don't agree with what I'm, I'm saying, just look at there and you figure out uh, what is going on here. I'm not prescribing. I thought that would be useful to put out. I would have loved to do 50 case studies and. Uh, and, and but I then had to kind of say, listen, it you kind of make the point if you do five or nine, uh, and and then it's really up to people to say what they want to do with it. So yeah, that's how the book, and that's why the book now, and that's why kind of the format. I I, I answered a, another question that you didn't ask, but the cases and so on. I thought would make it real for people. Got it, got it. I just want to sort of let the listeners know that they could sort of. Uh, if they have any questions, they could type into the Q&A box and we'll get to it in a, in a few minutes along the way. Building on what you said, Pramath, uh, I want to sort of pick up on something you said the last time we spoke in the context of the podcast, right? I think you, you used a phrase where you said the link between education and careers is getting more and more tenuous with the passage of time. Um, uh, and at the same time, you're saying that we need to think about education differently. You know, the other perspective that one of the uh, one of the people I was speaking to was giving me that was that education often solves three purposes. One is capability building. Two is uh, signaling in terms of letting the people know that you graduated from this place means that you're capable of X. And third is networks, which is, you know, the people you spend time with, the peer group, et cetera. Maybe there are more dimensions, but, but give us a sense of, you know, given the paradigm you explained, uh, uh, how should we think about Maybe just to take a discrete decision, let's say uh, undergrad education after 12th, you know, uh, parents are grappling with multiple choices, right? Liberal arts, STEM, India, overseas, uh, you know, commercial implications, et cetera. So what's a good, what's a good way to make, uh, make a decision like that? So I think the, in an ideal situation, you would pick 
you, you will have a pecking order of institutions that you will get into. Unfortunately, that's how the world works because the institution, you apply and the institutions choose you. So you can't freely right. say, I'll go study. Of course. You have of to course. go for it. So there's a certain reality that kicks in about, which includes depending on what system or what application process, which uses your past performance to offer your position. But let's say you have a slate of possibilities that you think you can get into or apply to and you get admission to at any stage of this. The radical view in my view would be to say, forget the major, forget what you want to specialize in or the degree you want to get. Go to the institution which has the best track record of develop, delivering great education, great environment, and that education would be in terms of the teachers, the peer group, the reputation, which is your, I think it was your second uh, point, uh, and the opportunity for you to explore. That's what I would do at the undergrad level. At the postgrad level, a lot of the same things would be true, but there you are typically looking to specialize in a particular area. So it, it the exploration might be more in terms of exploring a particular area better. But the same things would hold true. And the reason I say this is that for me, I'm convinced that suppose you are an engineering student, okay? If you had a top-notch, inspiring faculty member in history, and suppose you did four years of engineering and that meant 32 courses for a minute, eight semesters, four courses each minimum, you had one history professor, that one history professor could actually make you give up engineering and go into social sciences. or. I think inspiring teachers leave a much, much bigger impact on you and your career and your choices than the subjects. Now, would you not like to go to an institution which has 32 inspiring teachers rather than study metallurgical engineering? I would. And I think that serves you well in the long run because you have, and then if that was coupled with a class of 200 or 500 in, in your batch, as we call it, your class that are of very high caliber who are similarly there to explore. And then you project it to the remaining four or five batches, years of students who are there. You suddenly have a community that is very focused on making, helping you discover what you really care about, what you like, what you don't like. I feel like we don't talk enough about eliminating stuff. I mean, my life has always been about eliminating stuff, not doing metallurgical engineering, not settling for the state kind of siloed education, not wanting to be an academic, not wanting to be a consultant, right? It's almost like you're hiving off things that you don't want to do and in the process, excavating and discovering what you really want to do. Uh, so going back to your question, I think it's important to go into an atmosphere that allows you to shape what you want to do, at least at the higher ed level. Now, I think it's hard to achieve in an ideal situation. Therefore, you have to compromise. You have to work with the constraints that you have. But that mindset to say, listen, it doesn't matter whether I'm doing engineering or law or history or architecture. But if I can get into a, a great, place instead of a good place in a particular discipline, then I would rather go to the great place that allows me to grow, learn, as I'm saying in the title of the book, because that will stand me much better in the long run. And I fundamentally believe that because that between 17 to 18 to 21, 22 years old, 
unless you know you want to be a doctor or you know you want to be a lawyer. I mean, lawyers these days do the law degree and then they do whatever they want. I think that's been going on in the US for many years. And now here also law has become like a just a degree. Uh, some people take it and they don't, you don't necessarily have to become a lawyer. So other than being in medicine, engineering, we already know people do engineering and don't become engineers. Medicine, most people still go to medicine, but I find that people in architecture and design also are going off in all kinds of direction. So there are very few fields left where people are doing a professional undergrad and staying in that area forever. Hmm. So if that doesn't matter, then the major doesn't matter. And the major doesn't matter. Ideally, you should do a major and, and I'll come back to that. But at least go to a place which really allows you to discover, explore, and 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 make choices, which is part of a great education. I love the point you made about uh, uh, going to a place that gives you optionality or gives you an opportunity to explore. Very often, that's not something that we think explicitly about. We look at the ranking and just go with it. But I think the degrees of freedom you have, and to your point, if I go back to my IIT Madras days, we had to do four courses from the humanities department you know, as a, as a compulsory thing. And I still remember the, the, the professor who taught microeconomics yes. really sparked that curiosity uh, and sort of somehow, despite all the mechanical engineering courses, it's that microeconomics course that sort of left a mark yeah. over, the, over the four years. So, so very, very true. Um, moving to a different theme, Pramad, I think uh, you speak about an abundance of options today as compared to earlier. And as a corollary, I guess the bar on self-awareness has also gone up, right? I think earlier you could just trundle along and say, I want to be a chartered accountant or a, or a lawyer or a, or a doctor and you'd be okay. But now with the abundance of pathways, I feel, uh, you know, the if you don't do the hard work of self-discovery, you end up uh, in a funny place very soon today than you did maybe 15, 20 years back. I just wonder, one of the things you say in the book is, you know, passion is not something that uh, you discover overnight or something that you're born with, but it's something that you develop over a period of time with your experiences. Can you say more about uh, your ex your sort of observations here? Yes. So what has happened, I feel, is that younger and younger people are asking this question, what is my passion? What is my, am I doing purposeful, meaningful work. For some of us who are from the older generation, it feels like, hey, just do the work right now, right? Don't <laughs> get on with it. What is this thing about purpose and passion? It's too early in your life. But it, I, 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 I think you can have that reaction, but it's good that people are asking these questions early on in life. They are already more aware that they should be asking these questions. But in many cases, I think they are misguided about what this means. So the I, I feel like people feel like it's like the idea of a soulmate, right? That there's, there's some perfect person out there for you and you have to somehow search using different search methods that perfect person. Similarly, here there's a mentality that this this your purpose is a singular static thing and it needs to be found. And once you find it, that, you know, magic will happen. My simple philosophy or my simple understanding is that there is no, no such thing. You will have firstly multiple passions and multiple purposes through the course of your life. And you can't judge yourself or others or others shouldn't judge you. So some part of your life, your purpose might just be making lots of money. There's nothing wrong with that. That's your purpose or could be as much of a purpose as saying, I want to work towards creating some assets for me and my family or looking after my older parents or caring for somebody who's ill at home. Uh, but these things will keep changing. And 
because they are going to keep changing, there's a variety of purposes that you will have in your life. And what will serve to be your purpose at any particular stage of your life is something that you will chance upon, that in that sense you will uncover, discover as you go through life. And you, and that will mean that you'll get lucky uh, at some points in your life. And at other points, you'll realize that your whatever you are doing or where you are is actually at opposition with what your thought, what, what you think you wanted, you would have liked to do, you don't like, and you realize, oops, you know, that I made a mistake here or this doesn't work for me. And you'll have to go through that also. It's very much part of finding your purpose, contradictorily enough. And most people don't realize that, that, hey, if you're going to go look for something, then you're going to make some false starts and you're going to go off in the wrong direction sometimes. And that's actually part of the journey. Uh, it's not that you did anything wrong. In fact, it's you're doing exactly what you need to do because you screwed up. Uh, you picked a wrong major. You went after a job because you thought it was great and so on. I picked a career to be an academic and realized after seven years that, oops, I, not for me. So that's really what I mean, that don't have to be fixed, that you can actually match your work with your passion or with your purpose or your meaning. And it's good to start early. No, no harm in asking the question. But realize that, you know, when there will be periods when it will match, there will be periods where it won't match, that it will change, that you may have different phases. There is no one thing that you need to do. People tell me, oh, Pramat, you know, so how did you, dis you know, you did you always know that education was going to be, how the hell did I know that I was going to, there was something called building a university. I had no idea. Uh, or that this, I don't think this is going to be my passion for the rest of my life. I could change my view of what I want to do. And I, I think I'm all, I already am a little bit uh, saying, uh, I know I have a little bit of interest in Hindi literature through some of the work my father and grandfather did. And I think it might be an interesting phase in my life to just go back to devoting my life to doing that for some time, or at least as a next thing. So don't assume that you've reached the ultimate passion, if you will, or soul mate or soul purpose. It could be, uh, it could still evolve. I think that's the way to think about it. And I don't know if, again, if it sounds too uh, philosophical, but to me, it's very practical that that's how it will be for you. And I think in the book, uh, you use a term, you say, especially in an Indian context, given the competitiveness in Indian systems, uh, it often leads to premature conformity. Yes, use that phrase. A lot of people idea. have picked up. A lot of people have picked up that phrase. Interestingly, uh, uh -huh. so sort of bring that to life for us. Uh, how how does that show up in the kinds of decisions people make and uh, what they end up doing? Well, you know, Deepak, the worst of this is the uh, that certain schools still have these uh, firms and individuals who come and do an assessment on you, right, on your kid. Hmm. And, and then they'll say, oh, you should be a journalist, you should be a whatever, engineer. I think that's what I mean. I think <laughs> you, you're declaring and slotting somebody into a career at age 13 and saying this is what you're good for. It can be very limiting because people start seeing themselves as only that. I was talking about this with my uh, engineering team at Harappa, who I've recently started overseeing because our CTO left and I'm spilling in. And I, one of the things I'm telling them is to understand that being a software developer is not your only identity. Hmm. How do I get you out of thinking about yourself as, oh, I'm an engineer, I've done programming, I'm, I'm a software developer, I'm an IT guy, I'm a tech guy, and that's it. People can't imagine that they could actually be doing other things. So I first started, you know, my first thing was to just get to know some of them a little better. I discovered that one of the women in the batch, in the, in the, in the team, wants to be the president of India. Wow. 
And most people in the team didn't know that she's serious about it. That she's saying in, in, a, in a room full of her teammates, uh, mostly guys, uh, Pramod, can you tell me what does it need? What does it, what should I do to become the president of India? I really want to become the president now. I can get into why. But you know, here's a person with a very different identity and, and is willing to uh, uh, not conform uh, to being slotted as a woman, engineer, IT person, or a, how can you ever become the president? So I think we keep slotting people. Then we say, oh, you're good in science, do engineering or medicine. I mean, who said that? You can actually be just a scientist. You can be a writer. Uh, so I think at each stage, we are trying to get rid of, I go back to my original point, you're trying to get rid of the uncertainty because mm. the uncertainty scares you somehow. You want certainty. And I grew up that way too. My father was very concerned that I was not working as hard as my sisters because they would compare. So they would think that, you know, and I was the only son, so youngest, so they thought I would become spoiled. Uh, so they were very careful with my education, my upbringing. I was always being sort of guided by my cousins who had done certain things. Uh, there was an anxiety on the part of the parents that the world had changed and they wouldn't be able to guide their sons. So they should, the son should be guided by certain people in the family. And then I think my father's only thing was that, you know, I, you need to earn 10,000 rupees a month. Now, that was a big thing. It's I still remember that, as you can see. And so it le left a deep impression. And suddenly you are now saying, to me, the young me, it became, oh, if, I'm, if I can make a job, get to a job of 10,000 rupees a month, I'm done. I, have, I, I don't need to do anything. You know, that, that was my narrative. So that's where I think the early on, and I think put this in the book also that, you know, what you say to your children becomes their narrative. That becomes mm -hmm. their story. And I think it's very important to realize that, uh, that you take some things, and that leads to that conformity. And then I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not only bearing, blaming parents for it, uh, and I don't mean to blame. I think the parents who also really encourage their kids. But the social norms, society itself, uh, this thing that women can't do math, for example, at the Vedika program, we hear it all the time. And my point is, listen, to be a successful business person, all you need to know is the old board mass that we were taught in uh, class three, right? Which was just basic arithmetic. You think about it, uh, to use Excel, uh, you just need basic arithmetic. You don't need statistics or calculus. So we, we, we drive home these points that make everybody... Uh, scared and and therefore conforming and therefore limited in their mindset and that's that's what I mean by premature conformity. Got it. And and the, and the other theme uh, that comes up in the book as well, Pramat, is sort of this this jugalbandi of specialization and generalization, right? I think we all recognize that we need both. You know, people talk about the tea or the pie or, you know, other metaphors where you need to bring in a combination of deep expertise and breadth. But the question that sort of befuddles a lot of people is, you know, how should I think about when to go broad, when to go deep over your years of your lived experience and, and having seen thousands of students? Do you have a, uh, do you have a broad, uh, again, a paradigm or a framework for people to just think about the timing of how they think about generalization, specialization in their journeys? Or is that, again, once again, looking for false certainty in a messy world? <laughs> it is messy, uh, <laughs> but not as messy as it seems. Mm -hmm. I think that the tea or the pie, which for listeners who no, is is the the top part of the tea is your breadth and your skills that hold in any situation or any specialization. But the the 
the tail or the trunk of the tea or the pie are those things that you deep go deep into as a specialist. I think that uh, there isn't yet a symbol that describes what we are talking about, except to say that the tea becomes a pie and then pie becomes something with three trunks and four trunks and five trunks. And the point I'm trying to make is that I think it's a false trade-off, mm. this discussion about breadth and depth. I think you need both. Today's day and age, you actually need both in every situation. Different degrees of depth. You don't have to do a PhD. But the ability to go deep into a topic quickly is a core skill. And you're going to have to do that multiple times in your life. And you're going to have to do that constantly because the world is progressing so rapidly, it goes back to that point, that new things are going to emerge that have never been studied, examined, done, taught before. So you kind of have to learn from scratch. You have to do it yourself. And this do-it-yourself applies to becoming a specialist almost in a rapid way each time. Now, it could have to do with a task that your boss gave you with a two-day deadline. It could have to do with this job you're in, which you decide to do, end up doing for three, four years. Or it could have to do with being in similar jobs or industry or function over a period of 10 years of your life which also requires you to specialize, but the need to go deep and not be superficial, the need to not just read some things and say, oh, I'm an expert, uh, is, is much greater today than it was before. You can't be superficial. You, you have to learn how to go deep. So that... My point is you have to know how to get deep into a subject. The level of depth will depend on the context and how much time and how many hours and so on. There are books about 10,000 hours of whatever. I'm not getting to that, but I think it's important to understand that the need for constant specialization, if you want to use that word, has even gone up more. And it's exciting. I'm not saying this is a problem. I think it's just a new skill we have to develop. Earlier, you stayed in the job for a long time. That job didn't change for a long time. The world didn't change at all. Look what has happened to education. Look what has happened to you. You, you were following me across three different geographies to complete an interview. Now you're getting me on a video. And you have people listening in. And you're going to take a recording of this and post it. I mean, you had to learn all this. You have you've become good at it. You are now... You know that, you know, in the beginning, I'll bring in Pramath as a participant and then I will bring him in as a panelist. All this you have to learn very quickly if you're going to go master this medium. Uh, and like I said, it, this is, you are now, if, if somebody wants to do a podcast or wants to do a webinar alongside that podcast, you are the expert. You are a specialist as far as this is concerned and you've learned it. And tomorrow you give up all this and say, I'm just going to do coaching. You'll evolve coaching to another level too by, by getting deep into it. So I think this, you have to be both. But I think the nuance part of it is that the, the, the bottom, the, the T, the specialist part of it is like, it will keep happening every few Days, weeks, months, years, decades. True. Actually, if I may build on that metaphor, one of the people I spoke to, there's a lady called Linda Grattan at London Business School who speaks about the 100 years. <laughs> no, well, yeah. 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 Long, yeah. And she actually, years. yes. And she talks about the symbol pi. And actually, if you sort of, I studied the pi symbol after she spoke about it. She says, if you look at it, one leg is a solid leg, which goes deep. 
the other is actually a dancing foot the other element of the pie <laughs> okay <laughs> which actually suggests agility right so i, yeah. I thought uh, that take on the simple pie was uh, was pretty cool uh <laughs> i'm saying multiple dancing legs <laughs> multiple dancing legs more like a caterpillar possibly uh i want to come to a very specific point uh, pramath say i think in a lot of ways given that we all have grown up in a certain paradigm and the paradigm of education and careers is fundamentally <laughs> different today <clears throat> you know one one phrase that's been used quite often is the best service you can do to children is get out of their way you know when it comes to some of these decisions very tactically when it comes to some of these uh, pivotal decisions whether it's 12th to undergrad or undergrad to postgrad you know any uh, if i were to ask you what are some of the common mistakes that you see parents make in the way they support the child through some of these transitions yeah i think the figuratively one shouldn't get up i mean figuratively it's good to say get out of the way but literally i don't think we should get out of the way in fact children more than anything do need support and help and guidance uh, much more so than before because of the multiple choices hmm. and because they can it is confusing they need mentoring they need they need guidance but i think what you can do is in in the in the spirit of getting out of the way is to support them support them in things that they are interested in but but also help them think through choices i think that's great education hmm this education at the end of the day was always about judgment about developing the ability to decide to to choose to pick the best option and i think given that there are so many options available uh, you shouldn't get out of the way but you should say hey you can do this you can do this you can do this you want my advice you should do this but you rather do that well there may be some things that you wouldn't want them to do you can say listen i'm not going to allow that as a parent but here's five other things that i'm going to let you do and i'm happy to sit here and help you make those choices and it's okay mm. for you to make the wrong choice don't worry mm. Mm. and uh, yeah fine if 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 none of your friends are doing this don't worry that's good uh, you should be different you should make your mark equally don't do something just because your other friends are doing it find something so i think those kinds of conversations are better uh are 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 there to encourage and the, and 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 support them and use the multiple choices to actually make them learn hmm. even in what they do at work Uh, even what they do at home i can tell you that my best learning was that when my i think because my father was a bit paranoid about uh spoiling me <laughs> or i i often jokingly say that he was just lazy uh he would give me lots of errands lots and lots of errands and i would be doing all kinds of random stuff that he could have always asked some assistant or servant or driver or somebody else to do from a very young age and i have to tell you that that the best training i got was that right because you somehow had to go to a bank to get the job done and you know indian public sector banks in those days used to be very frustrating suddenly you're standing in line the guy goes off for lunch and you're standing in line for one hour and you know you have to deal with those situations i remember once being so frustrated because my father wanted some money and he sent me to the bank and they were giving me the run around and it was saturday and they said now we are closed and sorry we can't help you know you we've all encountered that i started crying i was such a small i was so small at that time that i got so stressed out that i started crying and the guys in the bank didn't know what to do but those situations made me much more aware that what kind of i i know that i became very early aware that i didn't like bullies or that i uh that that it bothered me that people didn't give good service uh, but i equally was very knew how to get good service when i wanted to turn on my charm stuff like that gives you and i think the equivalent of that is the choices that our kids have today you you may not think about sending your kids on errands because it's perhaps not you're not in a small town anymore it's not so safe and so on but 
you could give them the same learning by helping them do multiple things in their somewhat more protected life and 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 guiding them and 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 supporting them i love a couple of things you said pramath one is just being a sounding board for the decision and helping them think through the various choices and the second point you made in passing was actually to reassure them that it's okay if you if you make a if you make a wrong decision or if you make a false step you know i think even that psychological safety if i may uh, is 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 uh, can go a long way because when i when i talk to some of the people around there's a pressure of trying to get it right which i think to your earlier point can sometimes really stress out the child and the parent and it sort of it can really yeah uh, lead to a tense situation at home um i'm mindful of time pramath we are coming up to 7:30 so maybe uh, take a couple of questions from the audience before we yeah, wrap sure, up if that's sure, okay yeah sure 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 there's one from palash palash gupta and but he signed off as abhishek so maybe it's a different zoom id i think a couple of questions right one is you know he says when i was reading your book and looking at the examples of people you've cited it seemed like most people would be top decile in terms of iq his point was uh, again number one it's his observation maybe uh, maybe uh, it is it is not but the question is what would your advice be for people who are uh, in the 75th percentile or even lower i don't think my advice would change mm. and i don't mean to uh, pass judgment on my interviewers but i think whatever benchmark whatever criteria you would measure them against mm. the the they would be top decile on some and not and below 75% on others i think there's a wide variation i know these folks uh, and i started out by telling you that i'd purposely picked people who came from all kinds of different backgrounds and yes they're all doing well that's a different issue and i i grant that but equally i fundamentally believe that the human potential is unbounded it's it's unlimited genuinely and i'm not saying this to be cute for everyone it is a matter of opportunities and privilege so uh, you get limited sometimes because of where you're born and i do or realize that that's a problem but to the extent that you can to the extent that you have the privilege of accessing opportunities uh or, or, or you you have access to enough opportunities i think the same rules hold i can't do away with we can't do away with the constraints that the world imposes birth or you know society imposes on you but if you if you were to then look at your constraint albeit constrained space that you are part of i think there's you can you can do a lot i find that there are people who you know can do so much more but because they've been not guided or trained or given the opportunity they allow themselves to be limited i'll, I'll give you a simple example uh one of the people who worked at with my parents home uh, who was uneducated and gave his whole life to being a domestic worker now his son got a good education thanks to all of us right but somewhere along the way he decided that he was awkward about coming to take any advice from us or my sisters and so on now he's ended up in a situation where he's done well he's got, but you know this guy could have gone on to do an mba this guy could have gone to germany he's learned german and he's doing some german processing now i think what he could have done if he hadn't gotten caught in this thing that i won't get mentoring from my father's employers because i have to prove myself by myself it's a great idea and i kudos to him for where he's reached 
or that oh i i can't go and live in another city because of some mental sort of block about going and living in another part of the world these are things that became limiting factors for him and now he's 35 40 years old and he's finding it he's realizing that he made some wrong choices along the way and if only somebody had guided him or now i think that was a situation that could have been avoided if we if and i blame myself partly for it i should have just inserted myself into that situation i'm just giving you a small example of somebody who's not in that top decile so i think for everyone the potential is limitless i think it's a tragedy that they don't get the support that they don't get the opportunity that they don't get the guidance uh i think i would like to write this. somebody one of my employees today came to me and he said that you know would you allow me to translate your book in hindi and i said absolutely i want to get it translated uh i also want to make it a bit contextual to the hindi speaking hmm. audience uh hmm. because some of these to to the point that is being made some of these examples may seem not contextual to them but i think that the same examples exist everywhere at all levels of all levels of iq if you are taking that as a measure i think that's at I least love, my hmm i love the point you make pramod all of us are top d silence something right it's about just being yeah. it's tra- trying to discover what that is and slowly chipping away at that and I, again it may not be a eureka but uh, just sort of leaving room to discover that as we move along uh, uh lovely pramat uh, mindful of time we could keep going but i think in a way you've touched upon a word that's very close to my heart potential right in a way uh, uh, that's the title of the podcast or run as well play to potential yes yes so so in the context of all all all, <laughs> all your thinking your current book you know what what does the term mean to you uh when when we say play to potential i think you have a good definition of it i remember uh listening to some of what you uh, you you you've been very thoughtful about articulating this to me it is what you you are and could be capable of in terms of you know i always go back the the performance potential equation the tim what's his name waltney the tennis galloway? coach galloway Gal- no timothy galloway maybe yeah tim galloway yeah tim galloway who who talks about p is equal to p minus i right the potential performance is equal to potential minus, minus interference. interference yes so i do believe that for me your potential is really about your performance what you can do which is your performance or what you are able to do what you are doing and like passion or purpose which we talked about earlier you have to keep chipping away at the interferences and the more you reduce the interference the the more you discover your potential and you discover that through your performance it's not like it shows up on a radar or or in your brain right you discover your potential by doing something and saying oh wow i can do that you look back and you say really i i i i Five years ago, I would never have imagined that I could do that. But today, I'm able to speak ex tempore on a podcast with Deepak. So I think potential really is your performance that surprises you. And we have the unlimited capacity to surprise ourselves. People have not. we always look at others for inspiration but i think your first inspiration is you yourself we never stop to look at our own performance and say look one year ago five years ago 10 years ago i would have never imagined again this goes back to the iq point it doesn't have to do with iq every human being if they were to look back they'll say my god if that's how much i progressed or changed or grew or my performance went up uh look that's really a evidence of how your potential can grow and going forward it will only be more exponential compared to how i got up to this point so that's how i think sorry long answer but for me potential is really your performance 
that will one day blow your socks off <laughs> true if i may end with an anecdote that i picked up from one of my conversations with a lady called jennifer gavi burger she says that the human mind is sort of wired in a way that it sort of um you know we uh, we uh, tend to overestimate the changes that we've been through already in life and significantly underestimate what we could become from here on mm. it just she says it's just a part of human evolution that you think you've changed a lot from when you were 30 but if somebody asks you what would you be 20 years later you really struggle to sort of imagine Uh, a different version of yourself so therein lies the opportunity and therein lies the potential i guess uh, in terms of the to your point about being infinite and uh, boundless from a yeah, that what, note please what jennifer is saying is basically the interference on yes. the equation. yeah yes absolutely from a thank, thank you so you, much Deepa. for making this time on a tuesday evening and thank, thank you to you. all the all the listeners uh, who've tuned in and uh, we will sort of take a couple of days to edit this and publish this on youtube so we'll share the link shortly so thank you so much pramath and all the all the people that tuned in this evening thank you so much deepak thank you have a good evening bye